Hi folks, it's a concerned doctor, Miss Cough, and it is April 9th, 2020, about 10 p.m. Another tough day fighting COVID-19. Um, I'd like to uh, dive into hematology tonight and coagulation and anticoagulation. Um, it has been found over the last couple weeks that uh, there is certainly a process going on where we believe there's microvascular clots uh, that are occurring throughout the organ systems in the body from the lungs to the heart brain, possibly kidneys and liver. And uh, when this sort of ensues, uh, there can be multi-organ system failure and death. So uh, we'll talk about D-dimers tonight and again, anticoagulation and, and uh, try and get into some of those, um, uh, some of those states that are occurring. Uh, the fact of the night is that physiologist uh, Johannes Mueller first described fibrin, the substance of thrombus. Uh, this is going back to the 1800s. Uh, early to mid 1800s, I believe, and that fibrinogen, the soluble precursor to fibrin, was named by his student uh, Rudolf Urchow, and, and this was done at the Fredericks Wilhelms Institute in Germany. I think that's Berlin uh, area, and uh, Urchow went on to be uh, very uh, famous and, and many theories. Uh, one of them being the triad, the Urchow triad, which is you know a, a triad of how thrombus or clot is actually formed, and that hypercoagulability is needed. A hemodynamic change is needed, such as the um, blood would become uh, very still, or there'd be stasis, or some sort of turbulence, and that there's some sort of endothelial damage to the vessel, uh, or disruption or dysfunction that's occurring there. So again, hypercoagulability, hemodynamic changes, stasis or turbulence, and then uh, some sort of inflammatory or damage that occurs to the vessel. So if you went back about a month or so, at least here in uh, New Jersey, uh, we were uh, giving anticoagulants uh, as far as prophylaxis to prevent deep vein clots, DVTs as we call them, uh, for this you know, standard uh, uh, protocol. Somebody comes in high risk for clot, let's say they're not moving around, they have uh, pneumonia, uh, we were you know, giving them prophylaxis. However, over the last couple weeks it's been found that these patients are um, probably needing higher doses of anticoagulation, especially if they come in with a a lab test called the D-dimer that's significantly elevated. And in Wuhan, China, in the original uh, experience there, they did find that those patients who had significantly ele elevated D-dimers uh, were in fact at higher risk of death or mortality during that hospitalization. Uh, D-dimer is a fibrin degradation product. Um, remember fibrin being uh, described by Dr. Mueller as a substance of thrombus. And when that blood clot breaks down or degrades, uh, that's a process called fibrinolysis. And the D-dimer is named because it has two D fragments of fibrin that are sort of cross-linked together. Um, and so that's where that comes from. Um, patients also were found to go into DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is where the proteins in the blood that are for clotting uh, become sort of overreactive. Um, and, and what happens is clots form throughout the small vessels uh, pretty much throughout the entire body. And when clots are forming uh, with that, um, uh, that robustly, uh, what happens is, is the coagulation factors or proteins get all used up and then you can start bleeding. And I remember the great Dr. Edward Robert Friedlander taught me in Kansas City, uh, probably the smartest person I ever met in my life, uh, uh, taught us that you know when you go into DIC, not only do you clot, but that you can bleed literally from every orifice in the body. Um, so we know that patients now uh, with COVID-19, and I alluded to it last night on the LVN blog, uh, but that there's something going on where you know, we're not very concerned about the pus and the pneumonia so much, uh, the, uh, uh, but rather this inflammatory sort of pneumonitis that's occurring, uh, and, and there may be iron involved, and, and we discussed that a little bit. But that microclots are forming throughout the body, and again, this can occur pretty much everywhere, whether it be the lungs, kidneys, livers, even brains. Uh, autopsies have been done already, and they found clots throughout patients. I've had a, a few already with a pulmonary emboli or clots in the lungs, and I've spoken to some of my uh, cardiology colleagues, and they're finding inflammatory myocarditis or viral myocarditis, uh, not necessarily with viral inclusions in the heart. Uh, they haven't found that yet, but they've found uh, these sort of inflammatory mononuclear cells. Uh, if you were to actually biopsy heart muscle. Um, okay, so uh, again, DVTs and PEs are some, something to certainly be on the lookout for. 
Uh, Dr. Moll, M-O-L-L, is a well-known coagulation expert down at Chapel Hill at University of North Carolina and was quoted uh, uh, saying that, you know, the clots are happening despite prophylaxis and maybe we should put all patients on anticoagulation. Of course, there's always patients that were concerned about giving blood thinners as uh, they're miscalled. Uh, remember, these are not true blood thinners. They're not thinning the blood uh, exactly, but they are uh, trying to prevent them from getting thicker or clotting, if you will. Um, but there are patients that are at higher risk of bleeding. Uh, pa patients with low platelet counts, of course, we'd be concerned about. And patients who come in with gastrointestinal bleeds or bleeding from other places to begin with. Um, so it, it may turn out that we end up putting all these patients on therapeutic doses or, or what we call you know, therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. Some of these societies, the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, is recommending whether you go to the intensive care unit or to the regular ward floors uh, uh, to get low molecular weight products like Alovinox unless your uh, platelet count was less than 25,000. Uh, British recommendations are uh, prophylaxis in all high-risk patients. That would be a lower doses, such as 40 of Lovenox, unless you have renal insufficiency, it gets reduced. Um, and to rule out a pulmonary embolus or clot, if you have a precipitous drop or sudden drop in your oxygen levels uh, or your blood pressure drops suddenly. Sometimes it's not always easy or convenient to get the patient transported to get a CT angiogram or they're already having kidney failure. Uh, low molecular weight heparin is recommended over the oral forms. Um, however, there are institutions that are short-staffed and would, rather than giving, um, uh, you know, uh, injections, uh, would just give an oral agent once a day. Uh, the British Society was recommending switching patients on direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs, uh, such as Xarelto or Eliquis, uh, or maybe even oral uh, Coumadin. Uh, but I did see that they uh, recommended switching DOACs over to Lovenox uh, when they come in the door. Uh, our hospital, and at least some of my colleagues and myself, uh, are starting therapeutic doses unless there's a contraindication if the D-dimer level, as I mentioned, is over 1,500. Some want to see a fibrinogen level over 800 as well. Um, ideally, you want a product that has uh, anti-inflammatory properties as well. And, and of the uh, anticoagulants, such as unfractionated good old long-chain long heparin um, versus low-molecular weight Lovenox and some of the other uh, products uh, and, and the oral products, the one that has known anti-inflammatory of the most uh, would be unfractionated, uh, shorter acting long chain heparin. However, you have to check PTTs and uh, coagulation labs, uh, you know, sometimes up to every six hours and, and that, that can be a problem and obviously you have to send the staff in and using more PPE, et cetera, et cetera. So in conclusion, um, we are starting to figure out this puzzle with COVID-19. Um, we're finding that, you know, reports of clinicians doing central lines and finding that the blood is like jelly or, or thick, um, that there's something going on clotting-wise. Some are looking at antibodies and have found some, uh, some effect there, but that still needs to be studied more as well. Um, it seems like uh, that these patients, if their D-dimer is elevated significantly and I think 1,500 for now seems a reasonable goal uh, or target, I should say, to just give them uh, higher doses or therapeutic doses, that the benefit may outweigh that risk at this point. Um, so we have to try and, and, and save these organs and, and patients from going into multi-organ system failure. As, we've, as I mentioned before, there's, there's not terribly uh, horrible lung compliance, and we're putting these patients on mechanical ventilators, which has risk. Uh, if, if we can oxygenate them and keep them from going on the ventilators, that would be the ideal situation. And I think we are making attempts to do that. We're trying everything. And it's, it's encouraging to know that, you know, each day we hear more and more news, more and more data, uh, more and more studies, and more and more uh, potential medications and therapies to help these patients. Uh, tonight, I'd like to dedicate this vlog to my father, uh, the smartest hematologist oncologist uh, you'll ever meet. Unfortunately, he passed away many years ago, and uh, of course, uh, I love you, Dad, and this one's for you. Have a great night, guys, and sleep well.